So uh, my name's Ken Weston, and uh, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, being a professional cyber stalker. Um, I actually founded a, a company called Gadget Track, uh, kind of kind of fell into it. Um, I was sort of a reluctant hacker and CEO, um, and um, I actually learned quite a bit along the way. Um, I basically started developing various theft recovery tools um, to help recover stolen devices. Um, I uh, kind of got into um, also the investigation side because uh, law enforcement needed a lot of help. Um, and I'll kind of talk about some of those challenges and things I learned along the way. Um, so I've actually assisted law enforcement with a number of investigations and not just with the tools I developed. Um, a lot of times uh, they would come to me for you know, other theft recovery tools um, and, uh, or other data that they may have. Um, and I'll kind of talk about that too, sort of you know, how, to, how to harvest information from social media um, and other sources as well. Um, I'm not with Gadget Track anymore. I'm currently a senior security analyst at Tripwire, um, catching a different type of criminal um, and dealing with different types of data. Um, but uh, I still uh, still get to keep involved in some of this stuff with some of the investigations. So uh, for, for those of you into some hardcore justice porn, this is my wall of shame. Um, these are actual cases I've been involved with. Uh, you'll see a lot of photos taken by uh, web cameras. Um, I blur their faces out to protect the guilty. Um, and uh, some of these are also some of the folks I actually recovered devices for if we didn't have uh, photos of them from the web camera. Um, so what's interesting is that um, more than half the time uh, when I went to go recover a device, uh, the police would go in um, and they would find other crimes that were committed. Um, a lot of times uh, th there were fencing operations, um, drugs, they would find people that actually had warrants for other crimes, um, even got involved with a very violent carjacking um, and the laptop sort of served as a Trojan to help us um, identify and find the people that were involved. Um, and also, um, you know, by basically tro trojanizing devices, um, you know, itself becomes a trojan, providing visibility into these larger criminal enterprises. And I'll go into some of the details of these cases throughout the presentation. So that being said, um, you can probably imagine some of the work I do um, is, doesn't have its critics. Um, it's usually from folks who don't quite understand the intentions or the background of the tools. Um, the fact is uh, there are incredibly uh, there are tools that are much more invasive um, that are available uh, to do more nefarious things, such as rats, um, a lot of malware out there that people can use if they actually want to spy on someone. Um, you know, during the process of developing the tools, I was very concerned about how the tools might be used um, and also concerned about privacy. Actually, investigating some of the other theft rec recovery tools that were out there, I found a lot of them actually had back doors into the systems. Um, they would actually gather more data than they really needed. Um, and so I tried to develop a tool that was both useful for law enforcement investigations, but also balanced the privacy implications as well. Um, um, so uh, I also found on uh, mobile devices in particular that uh, applications uh, gather a lot more information um, than what I did, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So a lot of things that uh, marketing applications do are, are more scary than some of the information that I would gather for theft recovery purposes. Uh, I got started with this um, when I uh, was working for a company um, that was specializing in blocking USB devices. This was uh, a long time ago, 2007, 2008. Um, my exposure at that time to security was basically just as a server administrator trying to secure web servers and, um, and uh, managing the websites. Uh, and I got really interested in actually how these uh, USB-based tools were um, being used to uh, compromise networks. Um, you know, hacking is hard. You know, trying to access a network from outside it's very difficult, um, but um, being a lazy hacker, um, you know, using USB devices to compromise a system or steal data, it's a lot easier. Um, so I started actually working with these tools, and I actually created a website called USB Hacks, um, where I actually started posting some of the tools that the community was developing. I started working with some of these myself, um, and it was really interesting. I started getting some interesting inquiries from both sides of the law. Uh, that was the first time the FBI gave me a little call. Um, but I, I think once they understood my intentions, that this was more about raising awareness, because at that time nobody was actually talking about this or providing these tools, um, and now uh, you know they uh, at least they had those tools to play with. So network administrators can actually test their networks to see how um, it would react to these particular tools. Um, a lot of researchers actually still ask for those tools, so I actually put the uh, the URL there just below the title. So if you want to download those, um, just be careful. Most most should be picked up by antivirus, but uh, you can still modify some of the scripts and it'll still work. So, um, you know, after I brought it down, I thought about, you know, what, what if I was able to uh, utilize these tools and actually make them more friendly, right? So instead of taking a Trojan and, and actually causing damage, what if we turn that into a happy Trojan? <laughs> right? 
So, you know, the idea is, is very similar, is that, you know, uh, you plug in a flash drive, uh, utilize um, the auto run capability, um, you run a binary, and you're able to gather a lot of information. Um, and, uh, you know, you can do a lot where you can grab hashes, you can grab all this stuff, but for theft recovery purposes, I figured, you know, we get the IP address, we get um, internal network address, um, we can do some geolocation um, just off of the IP so we at least know what city they're in. Um, but the more useful information was the computer name and then the username of the person that actually... Um, um, is, uh, is using that system. And through that, I, I launched this as a free tool. Um, it was actually part of my uh, master's degree. It's my uh, the system that I built. And um, I put it out there for free, and I was just kind of curious if people would be interested in this. Um, it got on the homepage of DIG, and it got dug to death. It was like 20,000 people registered over the course of two to three days. Um, and as you can imagine, um, this was all coming into a central server. So it actually, um, you can actually activate tracking uh, remotely, um, and then when the device uh, gets connected, it'll then send data um, to the owner. Um, so so I was able to harvest a lot of information about the devices that this was working with, and it was uh, far beyond USB devices. I found that it was working with external har uh, hard drives, uh, GPS devices, because that's how you update the, the maps at the time. Um, it worked with also the, um, the um, iPods. So if they didn't have the right software on the time and you plug in an, uh, one of these iPods and you access it, it would actually get triggered as well, uh, which, was, which was pretty interesting. Um, I've gone ahead and I've um, uh, put the, the actual uh, USB client source code, at least one version of it, um, up here. Uh, so if uh, you guys get the slides or you want to uh, download it, it's in C++. Um, but then here's the auto run capability, right? So this was a, a massive vulnerability that uh, Microsoft put out there. And, you know, it's still, it's still present today. Um, you know, you'll even see um, uh, systems that are vulnerable in industrial environments, um, healthcare. Um, they're st still going to be running Windows XP and they're still vulnerable to these types of attacks. Um, and I'll kind of show some examples of that, too. Um, so you think that this, we, we would have learned by now that USB devices are, um, are bad. But um, even he, uh, Black Hat this year, uh, a, lot, a lot of people, they scattered a bunch of flash drives out, um, and they fell victim to it and had data stolen from their systems. I'm not sure if it was innocent bystanders. Hopefully it wasn't any of you guys. If it was one of you, get the hell out. So one thing I learned is that um, the trouble with getting uh, the IP address, you know, we, we talk a lot about attribution. Um, you know, this, uh, this attack came from China. Um, well, you know, IP address, you know, it, it's very, very difficult to uh, use for attribution. Uh, one thing I found is that uh, law enforcement don't like paperwork. They actually don't like doing a lot of work. Um, so it, when you're dealing with IP addresses, they have to do um, a lot of filing. They have to go through to get a court order, um, to get that information from an ISP. Um, you know, some of this process can take anywhere from two weeks to three months. It really depends on who you're dealing with. Um, it also doesn't, uh, it's not identity. It doesn't actually put the person in front of the computer. Um, so you can go and you can recover that, and it's like, yeah, that wasn't me. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, there's also, uh, you know, it can help with probable cause, but it's increasingly becoming a challenge to uh, use IP address for probable cause. Um, it's not always accurate as well, especially nowadays. You know, you have mobile hotspots, people at Starbucks, things like that. Um, so IP address really isn't, isn't working very well. And in, in general, it takes a really long time. When you're trying to recover a stolen device, it's, um, it's a major hassle because time Time is of the essence, especially when these devices are getting fenced. Um, so with this, though, uh, you know, I had the first, uh, uh, first that I know of, the first iPod recovery. Um, and it wasn't from my IP address. I was getting a lot of these things where a lot of kids were installing on their iPods. And it was easy because a lot of times these kids would steal it, and then they would go home, and then they would plug it in, and then they would be the, like the Kalapagos family. There's only one kid that had that last name. So um, the school was able to actually get the iPod back for, for those kids. So it was kind of fun. And I think it was cool, too, is that this time when we did this, is this the idea that if you steal something, um, it can be tracked? So I, I, I like to think that maybe that had um, a little bit of an impact on people's uh, wanting to steal these devices. Um, and also through this process, uh, when I, I learned um, all the devices it was working with, I found that it was working with these um, high-end thermal imaging cameras. So I was actually approached by a, a company to uh, develop a custom agent for them, um, where we actually uh, would use this to protect these devices that are around $3,000 to $300,000 uh, thermal imaging devices. Um, so it was a very similar uh, process. Um, the one thing with this was that um, they actually wrote uh, the images to an SD card. Um, so they're like, well, what if someone takes out the SD card? You know, so we actually wrote some custom um, code in the firmware where when it puts in a new uh, SD card, it'll actually write a new agent back to the SD card. So um, even if you put a new one in, it's still going um, to block it. 
What's really interesting, too, is that um, they weren't just, uh, just concerned about theft recovery, but also these devices are export controlled. And they were finding some of these devices were ending up in countries that they, they shouldn't be. Um, so that was another uh, sort of um, additional measures that they wanted to take. So if uh, one of these uh, cameras ended up somewhere and was connected to a computer um, in Iran, for example, um, they would be able to map that back to the reseller who actually sold it to them. And uh, so with this, too, is that I disguised, uh, in the other agents, I disguised the agent as a passwords file. Um, on this one, I disguised it as a thermal image of a cat. Meow. Um, so th this is actually some stuff that I was working on. I never actually released it. I was actually looking at how to do uh, similar things with, um, with OSX. Um, you don't have the auto run capability, but you can still trick people. Um, one of the big vulnerabilities I like to exploit is, um, is greed and stupidity. Um, but uh, I found some things that were really interesting. Um, is that you know, using AppleScript, um, and you know, why AppleScript, why not Objective-C? Uh, first, I'm a shitty programmer. And uh, two, AppleScript is trusted. Um, it actually has a lot of interfaces with a lot of other applications. So you can, if you're targeting an Apple system, you know that it's going to have iTunes, and it has an interface with this. So I can, um, and that's what I'm going to leverage. Um, so one thing I, I found, too, was that, uh, you know, Apple's a little tricky. Sorry, it's kind of tiny. You guys can't see that. But um, I, I disguised the, uh, the uh, Trojan as a MP3 file. Um, what's interesting with OSX is that if you try to put a, like a .mp3 on a, um, an app, it'll throw a .app at the end of it. So it's trying to help the user so that they know that's an application. So the first rule was to try to trick that. And I uh, used what's called a, a homoglyph. Um, so basically trying to f find a character that looks like a period. And there's a little Turkish character called an Oganek. Um, if you put that in there instead, um, it won't throw the .app on the end, and it looks like it's a, a .mp3. Um, and uh, I have a, a demo of this, too, which I'll try to do at the end if I have time. Um, but then further, you know, you can uh, disguise the icon, which is pretty simple. Um, and I've actually uh, put some of this code up. I'm just going to go through some uh, bits of it. Um, so there's an object where you can get system information. Um, there's also another one you can get where you can get all the um, applications that are currently running, um, which is cool. You can then write some scripts that will then um, interface with those applications and try to steal data. Um, the biggest one was um, I was trying to, you know, exfiltrate data. Sure, you can do things with shell scripts and, and whatnot, um, but sometimes that will throw errors or alerts. Um, so what I did was I uh, just I found a way to actually exfiltrate data through iTunes. So I will um, basically grab all that data that I want, um, and then there's some, some transcoding that I do. It's included um, in the URL here on my GitHub page. It's got the full script. Um, and then I'll pass it out and, uh, through iTunes. So, um, and then uh, iTunes, it actually will stream an MP3. So you think you're listening to some music while in the background uh, we're doing some bad stuff. Um, what's neat, too, is that you can actually do shell scripts um, from AppleScript, which is great. Um, and I'm not sure if you guys saw the, you know, the new OSX vulnerability. So I threw that in here. Just be careful if you run that on your system. Um, it's not on the one on GitHub, but still uh, review the code, please. I don't want to get in trouble. Um, so, so you know, USB is still it's still an attack vector. Uh, you know, it's still a threat. Uh, you know, we saw that with Stuxnet. We've seen it with uh, USB malware um, that even hit the International Space Station. Uh, more recently, we saw um, some U.S. power plants that um, actually had uh, were infiltrated with employee um, um, accidentally bringing in infected USB sticks. Um, again, a lot of those systems are still running vulnerable versions of Windows XP, which I think pretty much all of them are vulnerable now. Um, and also, we, we just saw this here again at Black Hat. So, um, you know, it still, still is a threat. So, uh, kind of moving on. Um, you know, IP address, you know, that's, that's a one piece of information. But um, a lot of times, you're going to need a lot of other da data. Um, this is a crazy wall. You guys seen this in like all the CSI shows, right? When you're trying to track a murder, um, they have all the evidence and they put these lines, right? Um, and that's uh, kind of the thought process that I follow as well. Um, tools that actually make this a lot easier nowadays are like Multigo. Um, it automates a lot of that process. Um, so I'm not sure if you ever used it, but it's, it's, it's a pretty great tool. Um, and uh, you can actually write a lot of custom transforms to do a lot of this work. Um, but basically, I had a case where I was tracking a flash drive, just to give you an example. And you know, we, we were able to get the initial IP address, um, and it was a, a weird username, too. It wasn't something that would actually identify a person. Um, and we, we mapped it to an AT&T subscriber. Um, but you know, AT&T is going to take like three months to track it down. Um, and the flash drive was from a professor, and he had some research data on it. Um, but it was still hard to convince law enforcement to spend their resources to go out and, and actually track this down. 
Um, so, but we did start getting connections from a, a university um, and a specific computer lab. Um, so that was useful because um, we also get the internal network um, information, which is, is useful. So we went to um, the university IT department and their campus security. And we found that, uh, yeah, so we got a timestamp, we have an internal address, but um, these are guest computers, so there wasn't actually a student ID when you log in. So we're still not able to get the specific person. Um, but I started asking questions, like what other um, data sources will we have here? Um, and come to find out, you have to swipe your student ID card to get in. And so they have logs there, right? So we were able to um, access those logs, we tie that with the timestamp. Now we have a list of who is in the actual room. Add to that, they also, uh, a year before, had a number of lap uh, systems that were actually stolen out of that um, lab, and so they actually had cameras as well. Um, what's really cool is that a lot of people don't realize that a lot of these cameras, when they actually uh, store the data, there's also a log file that gets generated. So we're able to correlate that timestamp as well to identify who specifically was in that room. Um, and uh, they were able to uh, use this information, um, found out who it was, um, you know, had uh, the professor as, lo as, long as well as the... Um, uh, campus security outside of the guy's classroom uh, the next day, and he got his, his device back, and all his information was still there. Yay! So after working with USB, uh, USB devices, I wanted to find ways of, um, you know, looking at how to recover more expensive devices like laptops. Um, you know, I looked at a lot of existing tools, um, and they relied heavily on the IP address, um, you know, which is, uh, and, uh, as I mentioned before, it takes a lot of time. Uh, some of them, actually, they'll utilize more invasive techniques as well. They'll actually open up a back door into the system, so they'll have recovery teams that can uh, deploy that. Um, they can install key loggers and other things like that, which um, I found that to be overly intrusive. And I think in many ways um, makes the system more vulnerable. Um, there's, uh, they also will put, sometimes put stuff in the firmware and muck with that. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of risks. And I found that you know we don't need to go to that uh, extreme. I think there's other ways of going about it and recovering devices. Um, so I combined utilizing the web camera and uh, you know with Wi-Fi based geolocation. There was a company that was already doing the web camera on the Mac, but um, no one was utilizing Wi-Fi location. Uh, this is around when the first iPhone came out, and that's what it was using. So I, I worked with Skyhook and uh, got that deployed uh, for this. Um, so we're able to get look geolocation, we're able to get camera information. Um, so this was sort of a game changer, um, especially for law enforcement, and there were, there were some challenges with it. So the way it worked is that you would, you would activate tracking on a remote server. Um, the device would check in to see you know, if it's been stolen, if it's been flagged, if it's supposed to start um, gathering evidence. Um, and there's a lot of different things that would trigger that. If it moved to a new network, if the IP address changed, if there was a login event. Um, so it was pretty smart. It would also know that if it changed location that it would sh also check in. Um, and so it would then send information. And at the time, I, I, I didn't want to manage a server, especially with the photos and things like that. So um, we just had it uh, go directly into Flickr. So you actually register your Flickr account, so that way you have control of all your data. Uh, you don't have to worry about a third party accessing your information or activating your camera and spying on you. I don't trust myself. Um, so whenever the laptop would connect, it would get the uh, location from Wi-Fi, it would uh, capture photos, and it would do this every 30 minutes, and it would do it very quickly. So the green light, it would just be like a, a blip. You wouldn't even notice that it was on. So for the location, uh, I used Skyhook Wireless. Uh, it was a great service. Um, but now geolocation is, is embedded in all the operating systems. There's APIs for it, um, you know, and pretty much every major, uh, um, both laptop as well as mobile um, operating systems. Um, you can also get location from the Google Maps API. So here's the kind of the, a call um, to how, you, how to go about doing that. So if you want to write your own scripts to track your devices, that's a, a, good, way to, a good way to go. So um, the first recovery I had was actually with this tool was um, in New York. Um, I, uh, I had to work with a New York police officer who was kind of an a-hole. Um, he, he was basically saying, he was really frustrated because he, he had to deal with these types of tools before and he's all pissed off because he's going to have to do all his paperwork. And I'm like, no, you're fine. Look, so, so the location is within 10 to 20 meters. And he goes, uh, okay, well, what's that, what's that mean? I go, just print out a photo of the guy, go to that location, ask around. And he's like, yeah, don't tell me how to do my job, all right? And uh, 
but then, uh, and then he did, right? And uh, they go in, and it was this owner um, of a tattoo uh, parlor. Um, and if you look at the photo in the background, you're going to see a lot of uh, cool toys. Um, so there's a, a nice big screen TV. Um, there's all sorts of cool synthesizers, all kinds of audio equipment. Uh, and so when the uh, police finally went in there, um, they found the uh, customers. Um, it was an iMac. Um, and they also found three laptops from uh, different cases um, and a lot of other stolen property. So this is one of those examples where you, you Trojanize an app and then the, the Trojan app is um, sort of unveils uh, all these different crimes are being committed. So, um, you know, I, at that one I said we had a 300% recovery rate because the other laptops were recovered. Uh, so another case we had was uh, in Portland, Oregon, where I live. Um, there was um, a group that was repeatedly breaking into um, schools. Um, so they were targeting um, a, a bunch of Portland schools. They would go in and they kept stealing laptops. What was really uh, frustrating was that they would do this continuously. They would go in, they would steal the laptops, the, the uh, district would go and replace those laptops. A week later, these guys would come back in and they would steal them again. It was like, it really, it was like, um, it was like four or five different schools that this kept happening to. So um, I approached them and I, I, uh, I said, hey, I got an idea. So we deployed this software to a bunch of um, bait laptops and we left them out. We didn't even put them um, like in their locked cabinets um, and just let them out there. And sure enough, a week later, <laughs> they got uh, ripped off. Um, so we got the, the network information, and um, this was a, a bit of a challenge. We were getting some photos, um, and uh, we actually got it to a house that was in Vancouver, Washington. Um, so um, that's kind of that's the next state over. It's right next to Portland. Um, and we got the location to this one, lo uh, one particular neighborhood. Um, and again, the location's within 10 to 20 meters. And so I, I told uh, them about, about this and gave the information, and the, the detective working on it, so he goes there and he thinks it's an exact location. He just goes to this one, um, it's a duplex, and he goes to one side of it, and the guy that answers the door, he knows him. It's the guy that works on his roof. And so he's all pissed off at me. He's like, you're, you guys don't know what the hell you're doing. Uh, so I was pissed off, and uh, so I drove out there. Um, and um, I started actually looking at the wireless. I don't know if you guys see it, but there's a little street there, and I, I, I pulled in, and I, I pulled out my laptop, and I started looking at the wireless networks in the area to make sure that it was accurate. Um, and sure enough, the thing is, the, there was a wireless network that was called, it was Russia, um, and uh, I look over, and they're right next to the, um, on the other side of the duplex, there's a car, and there's this big, like, Russian pride uh, bumper sticker on the car. <laughs> and then, I swear to God, I'm looking in there, and then this, this girl comes out, she starts washing the car, and then the guy who we have a photo of walks out, and I'm like, oh, shit, and he looks at me, and I, I'm, like, looking like I'm, uh, I'm looking for directions on my laptop, right? Like, I'm lost. Um, but I called the detective, and then they came out, and then uh, finally they, um, they were able to uh, continue the investigation. What's interesting with this is that they never actually told them this software was involved in their case. Um, I was an anonymous source, um, and they ended up arresting uh, six to seven people that were in, the, in, in this case. Um, it was an organized group. They were uh, stealing a lot of other uh, property as well, and some of them were pretty bad dudes. And um, they got them to think that they'd all ratted on each other, so it was kind of cool. <laughs> So um, for some reason, there's a lot of uh, sort of uh, these Russian guys that are involved in uh, stealing property in Oregon. Um, I was involved in another case where uh, the laptop was stolen and we didn't get anything for like two weeks. I'm like, oh man, they, they, like, they reformatted the hard drive or something, right? Um, but, um, you know, I, I tracked it and we started getting a ping in, in Missouri of all places. And I was like, how the hell did that happen, right? Um, so, you know, we're getting this, and there's this guy named Victor, um, and uh, he, he was nice enough to change the username on the computer to his full name. That was really nice of him to do. Uh, so he's, he's really trying to help us out. But I had, all, I had photos of him everywhere. The first one we had was at, uh, you know, he was in a McDonald's, um, and at one point he was in a hotel that was really shady, and there's like a girl behind him, there's something going on there. Um, but um, I was able to find that, yeah, I found his MySpace profile. Um, and uh, I was really noticed that he's really into Scion. He's a big car, car nut, just really into Scion. Um, and I found that um, he has a bunch of posts on a lot of different forums on Scion showing off his car. So that was helpful, too, because then he gave me his license plate number. Um, and he was also a big eBay seller. So he, he was selling, uh, he had a, a store and he was selling all kinds of car parts. So you can kind of tell what kind of business he's involved in. Um, and then he was nice too, well, not so nice, because he sold the stolen laptop to his friend, um, and uh, Omar, um, as well as a stolen bike. 
Um, and what happened here is that when the police actually went in, this is the first time uh, we worked the district attorney. He said, you guys have given us enough evidence that even if he doesn't have the laptop, we can bust him for possession of stolen property. Um, so that was kind of interesting. We're sort of like making case law. Um, but um, they... Uh, what was happening is that there's a, a Russian group that was here in Portland. They would steal a bunch of property. They would load it into this big white van, and there's another uh, Russian group in Missouri, and they would swap stolen property. Because where's the first place you're going to look when your laptop gets stolen? Craigslist, right. So uh, they're kind of smart there, but not that smart. We got them. Oh, yeah, and uh, Victor, too. Yeah, it was actually his dad who was involved in the one. So it was a birthday present. So his dad's a nice guy. He gave him a stolen laptop for his birthday. And now he has a criminal record. Thanks, Dad. Uh, there was another case where we had, uh, it was in Brazil, so it's not just in the U.S. This was a little bit of a challenging, actually, a little bit challenging working with uh, the Brazilian uh, police. Um, but... Um, uh, there was a, a, a couple of guys that were in their car, um, and these guys came out with guns and um, you know, said, get out of the car. Um, and then the driver, they punched him in the face, knocked him to the ground, um, and then kicked him. He had like broken ribs and a broken nose. Um, and then a um, uh, guy who actually installed my software, he had left his laptop. It was still in the, in the back. Um, so we started getting pings, and um, then uh, the police were actually really excited about this because they were, uh, I guess they did um, quite, this quite a bit, right? So uh, they were um, assaulting a lot of other people as well and, and stole a lot of vehicles. Um, but it's just a good example of um, you know, how this can work internationally as well. It doesn't just uh, have to be the U.S. Um, sometimes it depends on law enforcement, how willing they are to help out, um, but there's, there's ways of convincing them. Um, and here's the customer with his, uh, his laptop back. Um, he was a veterinary student, too. Um, he just finished his dissertation, um, and he didn't have it backed up. Um, so he was really happy to get it back. So um, then I also moved on to mobile. Um, so mobile is a little challenging because you know, geolocation is easier because it was already um, in, in the device itself. Um, but IP addresses becomes much more problematic. Um, we also wanted to, um, we found that people really don't care so much about the device as the data. Um, so we, we built a system for backing up photo and contact um, information. Um, and I was really concerned about actually doing that, like storing people's photos on a server. Um, you know, first of all, if we get hacked and someone accesses all of our customers' photos, that could be really bad, um, or you know, the contact information as well. Um, we, we saw this with the fappening, right, um, that the, the risks that are associated with that. Um, and um, so we built a system so that when you, you actually install the app, you enter a, a, a key, a privacy key, so it'll actually encrypt your images and your contact information before it sends it to the server. Um, I like this, too, because, um, you know, if we do get hacked, you know, we're, their data is still protected. Um, also, if law enforcement comes to us and they want, you know, information, um, yeah, here you go. It's a big encrypted blob, and they have to go to the customer to get that, that key. Um, so, um, and then you can also do the data wipe and things like that. Um, so I, I, I built this tool, and, um, and uh, I have a little bit of a video here to walk through um, one of the cases. So I'll, hopefully the video works that's helping track them down. News Channel 8's Ed Teachout spent the past two days with police and investigators on the trail of swiped cell phones. He's live outside the Washington Square Mall where the theft took place. Ed? Well, the managers of the Sprint store here at the Washington Square Mall behind me say they're very confident that tracking software developed only miles away from here and put onto their demo phones will lead to an arrest. Uh, this is a $500 phone. This ends up being a $450 phone. Two empty display cradles are all that remains after someone stole two demo cell phones from the Sprint store at Washington Square Mall on Saturday. Moments after surveillance video caught the theft on tape, employees initiated tracking software installed on the stolen phones. They were able to not only find the GPS location of the individuals that took them, uh, but also we've been able to uh, to monitor any activity that happens in the phone. That activity turned out to be pictures someone took shortly after the phones were stolen. Tiger police admit it's a brave new world when pictures taken on cell phones can be told to send back pictures once they're stolen. And that has not only piqued the interest of our investigators, but in essence uh, appears um, at this point could be very credible information for us to follow up on. The Portland creator of the software tracking the theft says police are on the right track. If they're not the thieves, they definitely know who stole it. And if you look over the head of this man, you'll see in the window an Oregon temporary permit. 
Philip, this is Ed. With the help of a gadget track investigator on the phone, we tracked the stolen phone signal to this Vancouver apartment complex. There we found the exact temporary permit and... Hi. Sorry, the young woman who told us off camera, a man she called Peter, had sent this photo to her Saturday evening, but says she knew nothing about the phones. Hi, my name's Ed. We tracked the second cell phone signal to this duplex about eight blocks away. You don't have an, a Samsung Epic phone in this location? No. At least we're here yesterday looking for it. We're back live now outside the Washington Square Mall where we've just obtained within the hour the DMV records on that temporary permit. Tiger police say they hope the men in the pictures will contact them soon so they can explain how their faces ended up on a stolen cell phone. Back to you. Thank you, Ed. Teach out. The contractors... <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, so, you know, this helpful, you know, we got, we had, uh, you know, the footage, again, kind of like I was talking about with, you know, the, the, um, the video camera footage, that's helpful, um, you know, actually see where they, they get caught it. Um, we have some challenges with some of these devices because the, the, um, the for some reason, the GPS coordinates weren't, um, with our software that's accessing it wasn't right. Um, but luckily, the photos that they took of themselves did have the GPS coordinates embedded in it, and we had a timestamp as well. So, they're really helpful. Um, as I mentioned, you know, stupidity is one of the, the better vulnerabilities that, that helps us out quite a bit. Um, you know, we were able to get the location from that um, as well. And of course, the trip permit, you know, that's just, that's just ridiculous. Um, but uh, they ended up um, getting these guys, and uh, they, again, they ended up, um, there was five guys that were involved in this, um, and they're actually stealing other property. Um, one of these guys actually had a warrant out for his arrest already, um, and they also, in the, in the process of investigating this, they also recovered a stolen car. So... And, and so what I learned from this, too, is I started looking at, you know, the, the data that's actually embedded um, in um, the images where it's really helpful. Um, so there's a lot of metadata uh, that's actually embedded in it. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with it. Um, it embeds GPS coordinates. It has a timestamp. Um, and I also started looking at high-end digital cameras, and I found a lot of them actually will embed the make, model, and serial number. Um, and um, a really good tool here, there's a URL for it's called EXIF tool. If you want to mess with um, EXIF data, um, write scripts um, to, to do this kind of work. Um, you can do that. Um, I also have a tool called exifscan.com um, where you can upload an image um, and uh, you can see what, uh, if there's GPS coordinates or serial number um, embedded in it. Um, you can do that. And one thing I found is that um, there's uh, several camera brands that actually will embed that serial number um, and many of them are you know, high-end cameras. So I wanted to go out and see if I could um, oh, um, you know, use this for tracking stolen cameras. Um, and one thing I found, too, is I had a reporter that actually um, asked me, you know, there was a, a thing about uh, uh, celebrities getting them, their nude photos hacked. Um, and the EXIF data, um, you know, the media kept saying, yeah, the, the, the phones were hacked. Um, but in actuality, the EXIF data revealed that it was actually multiple phones um, over the course of several years. So the odds of it being one device that was hacked um, is very slim. So the point of compromise was actually email. Uh, it was a guy named Chris Cheney um, who, who was just guessing their passwords. Um, now he's serving 10 years in jail. So I looked at, like, how can I um, use this information? There wasn't a way to actually search for it. You can search for a serial number. Um, sometimes you'll see something on Flickr, but um, I, I was like... I want a database of this data where I can actually go through and identify that. So I, I worked and experimented with something. Um, I was actually helping another startup friend of mine. Um, they were doing a thing called CPU usage where it's, you can actually, um, you know, you, you give up your idle computer time um, and they'll give you money um, for utilizing that. So a bunch of uh, computer labs at universities were using this. Um, sort of like um, SETI at home, but for other projects, right? And then um, you as a researcher could um, um, harness the power of uh, thousands of computers. So we wanted to experiment with this. So I, uh, I wanted to go through and I wanted to mine Flickr. Um, so the way that it works is um, I wrote some scripts to go out and, and um, hit the Flickr API. Um, Flickr was very restrictive on the API and how many calls you can make. Um, you, so trying to do that from one system and trying to do it quickly, um, they're going to block you. Um, I actually talked with um, a friend of mine who, 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 who they had some issues. Um, they, they saw the, the data and they saw the reports coming through. They're at Yahoo. Um, and they were trying to figure out who this was. And I, it was me. Um, but we, uh, so we, we, uh, we basically were allowed, we had about 200 computers at our disposal. And we went through and we mined all of Flickr. 
Uh, and it took about um, about three weeks to a month. Um, it was like four billion images. And so we had this huge database. Um, and then I, I put it out there in the media that this was available. Um, and you know the way that it works, um, you know, I also uh, mined um, 500 pics, Panoramio. I found other ones like TwitPic, Twitter, um, and some other sites as well. We started um, harvesting some data from there. Uh, so the way that it was working is that we would harvest this information and then you can actually put in the uh, serial number of your camera um, and then it'll show back results, all the images that we found. So the idea is that if your camera was stolen and then three months later you see a photo getting uploaded to Flickr, um, you can go recover your camera. And it was just a proof of concept, um, but it, it, it worked. Um, we actually, uh, uh, John Heller, uh, he saw this service. Um, he actually had a, a camera that was stolen when he was on assignment for Getty Images at the Egyptian Theater. Um, he just turned around basically and his uh, $9,000 worth of camera gear is gone. Um, he's a contractor. Uh, you know, he's not going to get that back. Um, it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty hurtful here. Uh, but he did a search, you know, and then he found an image on Flickr that was, um, you know, uploaded uh, well after it was stolen. Um, and that mapped to Facebook uh, to another professional photographer, um, and he was, uh, had a photo of all of his gear, um, and there, sure enough, was his camera. Um, the LAPD got involved, um, and what happened was the thief, he stole the camera from him. Um, he then sold it on Craigslist. And then the guy that bought it from on Craigslist had um, um, sold it on eBay. So someone, the person that actually had it had no idea that it was actually stolen. Um, but the police, they went in, they were able to recover it. Um, the guy that got it on eBay, uh, he went to the seller and he was able to get his money back. Yay. Uh, the other, uh, but the other guy, not so much. Um, but they went in uh, a year after it was stolen to the apartment where the guy bought it on Craigslist and they go in, the guy was still there and there was all kinds of other stolen property. So um, it's the first recovery of its kind I think I've ever seen like that. Um, um, you know, here's the report there, but uh, yeah, he got arrested. So uh, I had another case where a guy, um, Craigslist, I'm going to start calling it like crime list or something because that seems to be uh, where all this stuff happens. Um, he was selling a bunch of gear, uh, camera gear before he moved and uh, uh, a guy came uh, with cash in his hand. Uh, he wanted to take a look at this camera that he was selling. Um, takes him out to the garage, shows him the box. The guy just pops him one, knocks him to the ground and runs off. So uh, um, he actually found um, images that were mapped to it. I am just helping with, with this. Um, we got a lot of information about this guy um, and all the other photos that he was uploading to other social media websites as well. Um, and uh, he, he was doing some pretty interesting things, um, you know, taking photos of themselves, smoking weed, uh, driving down the freeway, uh, you know, photo of himself with a gun showing how hardcore he is. Um, and they also took a photo of um, his uh, speedometer uh, going 110 miles an hour down the freeway while, sm while smoking dope. And we had the uh, timestamp, geolocation, and everything, so law enforcement really liked that. <laughs> yeah. Vulnerability, stupidity. Um, and this tool was actually also used by ICE, uh, so they're really interested in using this in the Child Exploitation Investigations Unit. Um, so uh, they do some really co uh, cool work where um, a lot of these guys that are actually uh, victimizing children, um, there's some sick forums out there where they'll actually be giving each other advice. Um, and they'll actually upload photos of, hey, this, there's this young girl I have in my car. Um, and they can actually look at some of the images, um, the I ICE guys, um, like a, a road sign or something like that. They look for some indicators that they can go and try to um, stop this before anything happens. Um, and so they were actually utilizing this tool as well. So the idea is that, um, you know, uh, Joe Pervert is, um, uh, he's uploading child porn and um, maybe he's using the same camera when he goes to Disneyland and takes photos with his family. So if you get a, a, a serial number of one of these images, um, and it's an image is what they call, um, and, you know, you map that and correlate that with an, a camera on Flickr, for example, um, that can help them ID a suspect. Um, I'm not sure if it was actually ever used or ever caught anybody. They couldn't tell me, but um, I thought it was kind of a cool application of it. So uh, basically what I learned a lot is like, you know, there's a lot of pieces of information out there that can be used to identify um, a, a suspect. Um, this is uh, Edmund Lacard, um, and he's sort of the, uh, the uh, grandfather of forensic science. Um, and he has this, co this thing called Lacard's exchange principle, um, that every contact leaves a trace. Of course, he was talking about physical crimes. Like when you go commit a crime, you actually bring something with you and you leave something behind. Um, and so I believe that actually carries over into the digital world as well, uh, from my experience. Um, you know, we have all these pieces of data, um, you know, IP addresses. Uh, I get really worried about all these different breaches that are happening. Um, you know, we have all these data points, and when we start to correlate them, we can actually start to create a rich profile of an individual. 
Um, and then we talk about Internet of Things and all the different places where we can find those indicators from device IDs, um, things that we may not even think about right now that can identify us. Um, a technology can exist a year from now that will actually allow us to mine that and identify us. Uh, identify us. And I talk about interaction of things. You know, there's, there's data that's created by us that we're aware of. Um, there's data created that for us um, that we may not be aware of. Um, there's also data created about us that, that correlates all this information. Um, so I really worry about uh, the marketing um, groups in particular. And then there's what I call boogie data. So a lot of people don't realize that when you send an SMS message, for example, you, you delete it, the other person deletes it. But the problem is there's 20 log files that get generated at least uh, through the carrier, right? So there's always a trace somewhere of this information. Or um, we talk about like Ashley Madison and things like that where we think our, 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 uh, our, our privacy is being protected when it's, in actuality it's not. Um, so I call this boogie data because it's information that's out there um, and it's, um, it can come back and haunt us later. Um, and it can, it's going to hit us really hard. Um, I've been working with a group, uh, uh, Privacy Century. They have an application called uh, spyaware.b. Um, and it, it's actually looking at applications um, that are accessing your location and sending that information. Uh, we've been doing some really interesting research here, um, identifying um, um, some very popular applications that are actually gathering location, um, your IMEI, IMSI, and sending it to servers in China, for example. And that's it for my uh, talk here. Um, if you guys have questions, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or on my email. Um, do we have more time? Uh, five minutes? Okay, I'm going to do a quick demo. Let's see if this works. Demo gods. All right, so here's uh, the Mac Trojan. You guys ready? So here you see it says like dot .app. Here's another one that's an MP3. If I double click on this, if the network connection works, we should see it, see it in action. Thanks a lot, guys.